Good afternoon. This is Terry Benton, and with me is Don Hastings. We're going to study the Bible together. I hope that you have your Bible and you'll follow very closely. We're going to talk about baptism and what it is. What is baptism? And we'll find out whether uh, it is sprinkling or whether it's pouring or whether it's immersion or even whether it matters or not. But is baptism just anything we want it to be? Or did God define what baptism is? Now, if man gets to define what baptism is, then it doesn't matter. We can just define it any way we want to. But if it does matter, that is, God has defined what baptism is, then we need to listen to what God says and obey God. Because to do otherwise would be, wouldn't that be rebellion? Uh, if we just made it up and says, I, I'm going to ignore what you said on it, God, because I want it to be this. So if, how does the Bible, uh, God's Word, how does it define baptism, Don? How about taking that? Well, W.E. Vine, in his expository dictionary of New Testament words, defines baptism as consisting of the processes of immersion, submersion, and emergence from bapto meaning to dip so the word means to immerse okay so the word meaning immerse you mean you can't um, find any places where the word baptizo means sprinkle or pour no there are words in the greek language for sprinkling and pouring but those are words are not used when it has reference to baptism. Okay, so that you can find words that are translated sprinkle, but none of those are related to the subject of baptism. Is that correct? That's correct. Like, for example, you can see in 1 Peter 1, verse 2, where he sp there's the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. And it kind of goes back to the Old Testament illustration of the priest sprinkling the people, but none of those occasions of sprinkling uses in the Septuagint or uh, in any Greek version the word baptizo. So the word baptizo means to dip or to immerse and that's that's all you can find as far as the meaning of that word. Right. So <clears throat> let's think about then uh, how this word has become misused. Why is it that the modern dictionary, the modern English dictionary, you can look that word up in Webster's and you will find words like sprinkling or pouring. Well, the dictionary defines words according to the modern usage of it and not necessarily what the Bible says. So we need to make sure we're studying God's word and get his definition of baptism. I think that's right, that we have to look at God's definition because a lot of words get get changed by man even though the bible stays the same people tend to uh, to drift away from what the bible says and then it gets a new human definition but it that doesn't carry god's definition with it so let's look at the bible then and see where where this word uh, baptism is used and how it's used to let to let us nail down what is how can you prove that it's immersion just by looking at an English version of the Bible. Well, there's a number of examples that show by necessary inference that the person was immersed in water. For example, when Jesus was baptized, he came up immediately from the water. Matthew 3, verse 16. The fact that Jesus came up immediately from the water necessarily implies that he went down into the water and that also implies immersion that he come up out of and went down into. You don't have to go in the water to be sprinkled or have water poured on you, but you do in order to be immersed. Yeah, so, the, so John, if uh, sprinkling was okay, he could have just carried some water around and sprinkled Jesus or anybody. But Jesus went down into the water and then he did something. He baptized him. All right, so that's that's a necessary inference. That's a good inference. Have you got something else that would back that, that premise up? Yes. Uh, Philip and the eunuch from Ethiopia in Acts chapter 8. The Bible tells us in chapter 8 and verse 38 
that they went down into the water and he, Philip, baptized him, the eunuch. And this example necessarily implies immersion. For the one doing the baptizing and the one being baptized, both went down into the water. And that would not be necessary for sprinkling or pouring, but it is necessary in order to immerse someone for the one doing the baptizing to be in the water with that individual and to bury them in the water of baptism. Yeah, that uh, confirms also what John, or what John chapter 3 verse 23 talks about, says that John was baptizing at a certain place. And John 3 23 says, because there was much water there. You don't need much water if you're going to sprinkle or if you're just going to pour a little bit and it's just a ceremonial thing that doesn't mean much. But in the case of baptism in the Bible, it's not carrying the water to somebody, it's carrying the person to the water, going down into the water and being immersed. And that's every example that you see in the New Testament, every command related to it uh, shows that to be the case. Now, Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. What did he do? He, he plunged him beneath the waters. Is there a significance to that? Is there a reason to plunge somebody? Is there a passage in the New Testament that might shed some light on why you bury somebody? Yes, in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So baptism represents the burial of Jesus, and he was completely submerged in the ground with the rock in front of the tomb, and we want to be buried with Jesus in baptism. And you can't, uh, you, you can't figure that they just sprinkle some dirt on top of Jesus, can you? I don't think that's that, a burial. That's not a burial, is it? All right, so this is a very powerful verse, Romans 6, 6, 4. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism. And then the illustration of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is clearly seen in this because in the earlier part of this, he, he says, uh, you died to sin. So that's, that corresponds to Jesus' death, except what we do is we're dying to sin and we're dying with Jesus. And we're being buried with Jesus. And we're raised to walk a new life, a life that is in keeping with the teaching of, of God's word. And we are a new creature. We have been born again. This is what being born again means, is to be buried with Christ in baptism and then resurrected from that watery grave to live a life that imitates our Lord. All right, so it's pretty clear then that all of the passages on baptism are immersion, immersion in water, and the person is, first dies to sin and is buried with Christ in baptism and then rises up from baptism to walk in newness of life. And you see that illustrated in the Ethiopian eunuch. When was he happy? When he came up from the water, he was happy. Why? Because his sins had been washed away. He was now in Christ and he had remission of sins and he had a great hope, a great future, a new life. So that's the uh, illustration of baptism. Is there, uh, one, is there another, not one more passage that shows us something about the burial part of it? In Colossians 2 and verse 12 mentions also that we are buried uh, with Christ. You have that, Brother Terry? Yeah, Colossians 2 verse 12 again says buried with him in baptism buried with him in baptism. So sprinkling just will not do the job. Uh, we just need to make be clear about that. What is God's will on this? And let's be people who are determined to do the will of God. So will God go along with us? If we just say, well, I just, I don't think it matters to God. 
Um, can we, can, won't he just count it, count sprinkling as baptism? Since we did, we, we counted it as, as baptism. Won't God just go along with that? No. What we think is not the standard of what is right and wrong in the eyes of God. He has given us his word to teach us what pleases him. And we must abide in that word. You have the Old Testament example of Nadab and Abihu yeah. in Leviticus chapter 10. And they thought they could use fire from another altar. It seemed good to them. Fire is fire and it'll burn. But God has specified which altar the fire is to come from. And they disrespected God. And God sent down fire from heaven and burned them up. So this is a very serious matter. So you can't just um, make up something you want to do and God just, you can just figure God automatically go along with it. Uh, Nadab and Abihu learned differently, didn't they? They certainly did. So um, another warning in the New Testament is that um, if you go onward, this is Second John 9 and 10, if you go onward and do not stay in the doctrine of Christ, he says you don't have God. That's just how serious it is. So when somebody says uh, baptism is not all that important, well, every case of conversion that we see in the New Testament shows that it was, and it is important to God. And the way that they were baptized and the reason that they were baptized was all very important to God. So we've got to stay in the doctrine of Christ that tells us these particular details and don't venture away from them because that would be just as dangerous as Nadab and Abihu. So here's my final question then. Can we stay in a church that practices sprinkling for baptism? No, I wouldn't advise anyone to do that because we want to be in the church that Jesus built. He said, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. And he's the head of the church and he's the foundation of the church. It's his church. And so we will abide by his teaching if we want to please him and be a part of the church that he built and those are the ones that are going to go to heaven are those that are in his church so it's very important that we be a part of the lord's church and practice things like he has commanded us to practice them so just stay with the bible let god's word prevail over all the doctrines of men the ideas of men even our own Upbringing can be wrong. We could have been taught something all of our life and then come to discover, well, I never even noticed that. I never read my Bible. And now it's brought to your attention. You need to stick with the Bible. You got any other Bible questions on other topics? We'll do a series of little short snippets like this on different topics. If you have a Bible question you'd like us to address, uh, send it to Terry W. Benton at gmail.com and we'll entertain that particular question at some point in time in our series of studies. Thank you and God bless. Thank you.